Ed Scarborough cut his teeth chasing outlaws like Black Jack Ketchum when he was still a teenager. He'd go on to become a deputy sheriff and constable, as well as one of the first Arizona Rangers. According to those who knew him, Ed was born to a saddle, an excellent marksman, and just did not know the meaning of the word fear. Make no mistake about it, Ed Scarborough killed many a sassy bandit over the course of his career. Be that as it may, the toughest opponents he'd ever faced turned out to be himself and a rabid skunk. Oh boy, tossing a little bit of cross-dressing, a shootout with a bicycle, some good old-fashioned murder, and a daring prison escape, and we've got what may be the most absurd tale I've ever had the pleasure to share. Trust me, you are not going to want to skip this one. My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. George Edgar Scarborough was born on January 12, 1879 in McCulloch County, Texas. And if the name Scarborough rings a bell, that's likely due to Ed's daddy being George Adolphus Scarborough, the man who killed the man who killed John Wesley Hardin. George Sr. spent decades working as a lawman, first as sheriff of Jones County, Texas, and then as a deputy U.S. marshal working out of El Paso. And it was there in El Paso in 1895 that George Scarborough was involved in the controversial killing of Martin Moroz. This in and of itself is an absolutely crazy story that I will go way more in depth on in the near future. But long story short, the notorious gunman, John Wesley Hardin, allegedly paid Scarborough, along with El Paso Chief of Police Jeff Milton, and possibly his constable, John Selman Sr., to kill Mr. Moroz. Just three weeks later, Selman would kill John Wesley Harden, and then, less than a year after that, Scarborough would gun down John Selman. George then headed over to New Mexico, where he went to work for the Grant County Cattlemen's Association, and in April of the year 1900, it was finally his turn to die by the gun as he attempted to apprehend a few remnants of the Wild Bunch. Which brings us back to his boy, Ed Scarborough. By the time Ed was just 18 years of age, he was saddling up and helping his father on these various manhunting expeditions. As such, by the time of George's death, the then 21-year-old Ed was already well on his way to becoming a distinguished lawman. Not only was he one of the first ever Arizona Rangers, but he also tracked down and arrested Todd Carver, one of the men suspected of killing his daddy. And you know that must have felt good. Only thing is, Scarborough seems to have had a little bit of an ego problem. Despite being initially lauded by his peers, Ed was dismissed from the Rangers after just nine months due to his quote-unquote high-handed arrest tactics. That and his all-around hot-headedness. Hell so volatile was Ed Scarborough that he even tried to draw down on his own Ranger captain, a guy by the name of Burt Mossman. Now I think it goes without saying that the Arizona Rangers are far inferior to the Texas variety. Be that as it may, it still ain't no small thing making a Ranger captain over in the Grand Canyon State. And Captain Mossman, a legend in his own right, was about the last person that Ed should have tried to tangle with. Luckily for Scarborough, Mossman simply introduced his fist to the young lawman's face before Ed could clear leather. But things could have been much, much worse. Despite this much-needed attitude adjustment and his lack of employment as an Arizona Ranger, Scarborough would still continue working in law enforcement in various capacities. A career that nearly came to an end as he was tracking cattle thieves near New Mexico's Hatchita Mountains. Ed was asleep one evening when a damn skunk crawled up in his blankets and gave him a little love bite on the wrist. Hell of a way to wake up, right? Scarborough hops up out of his blanket in a panic, can't blame him there, and shakes the skunk loose, but it comes lunging back, causing Ed to fetch his pistol and open up fire. He misses, but I guess the flash and the bang was enough to make the skunk skedaddle. Momentarily, at least. Ed finally settles down enough to try to get some more shut-eye, and here comes the skunk again, launching a third assault. Luckily, this time Scarborough was ready, and he got a direct hit on Pepe Le Pew with his Winchester, and that was that. Still a nerve-wracking experience, right? Especially considering that there's really only one reason for a critter to act in such an aggressive manner. I'll give you a hint. It starts with an R, and it rhymes with scabies. Now, according to Google, the rabies vaccine did already exist at this time, although I was unable to determine how widely distributed or available it was, which may explain Scarborough's next course of action. 
The stricken lawman beat feet to the big city of El Paso, where he underwent a little something known as mad stone treatment. Now, this was completely new to me, but apparently mad stones, also known as basil or stones, can be found in the stomachs or intestines of cut and animals and were used in centuries past to draw poison out of bites or wounds. This is done by boiling the stones in sweet milk or sometimes alcohol and then applying it to the injury in question. Legend has it that once the stone is attached to a wound, it can't be pulled off, but once it absorbs the poison, it'll simply fall away on its own accord. I don't know about all that. Me personally, I get bit by a skunk, I'm going to the damn urgent care, okay? Not no damn El Paso Bruja. My skepticism aside, however, I do feel like I should point out that Ed did not die. And to be fair, I guess we don't know for sure that the skunk was rabid. I'm also not a doctor, and I'll admit complete ignorance as to whether or not it's possible for someone to get bitten by a rabid animal, only for the virus not to take effect. Now, I'm sure that's happened somewhere at some time throughout history. What I do know is that even nowadays, despite Michael Scott's best efforts, some 60,000 people per year succumb to rabies. And there have been very, very few recorded cases of someone surviving without proper medical treatment. Statistically, if you get rabies and you do not get yourself some legit doctoring, you're as good as dead. And just like you heard me say, Scarborough didn't die. That being the case, his behavior does seem to have grown increasingly erratic following this incident, like the time he decided to get into a gunfight with a bicycle. It was March in 1904 and Scarborough was employed as a constable in Douglas, Arizona. And it's there on the streets of Douglas that Ed came face to face with his most formidable foe since that skunk, a young bicycle enthusiast named Rube Shields. It seems that Rube came riding into town one day and took to doing bicycle tricks in front of a growing and astonished crowd. And I guess Scarborough didn't much like bicycles or he didn't like the idea of anyone other than him getting attention. Or maybe he was just looking for yet another excuse to throw his weight around which, according to news articles from back in the day, does seem to be his M.O. Whatever the case, things started off mildly enough with Scarborough simply ordering Shields to desist and move on. Rube wasn't having it, though, and bluntly told Ed not to bother him as he was in the process of attempting a rather difficult stunt. Oh boy, this casual defiance really pushes Scarborough over the edge. Not only does he bristle and tell Shields not to talk back, but then, just to emphasize his point, he goes ahead and pulls out his service revolver and starts blasting away at Rube's bike tires, laughing like a maniac while doing so. You would think Rube Shields would then scurry in fear, right? Negative. In fact, he does the exact opposite. Ducking his head down low, the young man began pedaling with all his might, straight ahead at the crazed constable Ed Scarborough. And before Ed could draw a good bead, BAM! Rube slams right into him. Dismounting from his bike, which I can only assume was a little dented at this point, Shields proceeds to bend down and grab the stunned Scarborough by the throat, disarm him, and then, as one newspaper account put it, took his time and skillfully kicked Ed Scarborough into a state of utter submission. Now I'm a two sides of the story kind of guy. I always feel like that's the best way of viewing the world, right? Trying to see things from the other person's point of view. On one hand, I think we can all agree that bicyclists can be pretty damn annoying. I mean, yeah, I understand they have a right to be on the road just like the rest of us, and they're not only getting exercise, but they're also helping to reduce pollution in the process. I get that. Fine. Great. But do they need to look so damn ridiculous while doing so? I'm not saying it's okay to take a shot at somebody for any reason, much less for riding a bicycle. But I am saying that if you decide to take a bike on the damn freeway in your little tiny shorts and silly looking helmet, you gotta at least expect a little aggression every now and then. On the other hand, I'm picking up on some real angry boomer, get off my lawn vibes from Ed Scarborough. It's like he all of a sudden became the old west version of a mall cop who's irrationally angry over just the sight of a teenager enjoying himself on a skateboard. Hey, we'll get back to the story in just a moment, but first, I gotta be honest with you. I'm doing this full time now. The Wild West Extravaganza is, as we speak, my job. And to tell you the truth, this is sort of a gamble. I'm gambling on myself, and I'm gambling on you. To make this work, and to continue bringing you true tales from the Wild and Woolly West, in an unfiltered and uncensored fashion, I'm gonna need your support. 
And at this moment, the absolute best way you can support the Wild West extravaganza is by becoming a member of Into History. Into History is a podcast subscription channel made by history lovers for history lovers. Not only will you get to listen to the Wild West extravaganza ad-free, but you'll gain early access before anyone else. You also get bonus content. There is currently Wild West extravaganza content on Into History that you cannot hear anywhere else, not even on Patreon. And there's a lot more to come. You'll also get to participate in the book club, the community forum, the upcoming live streaming events, and best of all, you won't have to hear my annoying ass voice break into the middle of a story like I'm doing right now. And guess what? You also get everything I just mentioned from all the other shows in the Into History universe, offering the same perks. Come on! What are you waiting for? Go to intohistory.com forward slash Wild West Extra. That's intohistory.com forward slash Wild West Extra to become a member today. I love you and thank you very much for assisting me in helping to keep the Old West alive. Back to the show. We obviously don't know the whole story. Maybe the kid was obstructing traffic or blocking the entrance to a local business, something like that. And maybe he shouldn't have smarted off. But I'm willing to bet that whatever Shields was doing on that bicycle most certainly did not justify a member of law enforcement opening up fire. And it looks like I'm not the only one who felt that way. Not only was Ed Scarborough arrested and fined, while Rube Shields got off completely scot-free, but Ed also got sacked from his job. According to the aforementioned news article, quote, Rube is now the hero of the hour and Ed goes around looking like a broken man with a secret sorrow. End quote. And sadly, that was just the beginning of Ed Scarborough's downward spiral. Out of work and looking to make a quick buck, Scarborough decided to hold up a restaurant over in Deming, New Mexico. That in and of itself is bad enough, right? I mean, the guy had dedicated his entire life to upholding and enforcing the law. And here he goes, throwing away whatever reputation he still had and doing the very thing he had always fought against. Ah, but it gets worse. Not only does Ed Scarborough rob that restaurant, making off with a whopping $24, but he does so in drag, wearing his girlfriend's dress. But wait, there's more. The genius then removes his cute little outfit and returns to the scene of the crime and orders lunch. Restaurant employees immediately recognize Ed's voice, and he soon found himself locked up behind bars yet again. Now, this incarceration would not last long, Ed was released on bail and was somewhat successful in fighting the case, but the man just could not manage to stay out of trouble. By 1909, Scarborough would be arrested for horse theft, and then, a few years later, he started feuding with Arizona rancher John Clifton over where to graze cattle, an argument that led to Scarborough killing Mr. Clifton right there in his front yard. Ed was arrested again, tried, convicted, and given life in the Arizona State Penitentiary a sentence he commenced to undergoing on May 19, 1916, as inmate number 4787. That's crazy to think about. You know, in just a few short years, this guy had gone from being a respected lawman, an Arizona Ranger, to a life destined behind bars, and he wasn't even 40 years old. To make matters worse, he had a wife and young daughter who now had to fend for themselves. But you know how that goes, right? Prison isn't exactly easy on a marriage, and a life sentence is a little too long to expect a woman to wait. As you can imagine, Ed soon received that dreaded Dear John letter. Seems his wife had fallen in love with another man, a railroad conductor by the name of Omar Ash. And Scarborough wasn't exactly thrilled at this new development, to say the least. Vowing revenge, Ed made it clear to all who'd listen that his new mission in life was to escape jail and kill both his wife and her new lover. And sure enough, after just one year and six days behind bars, Ed Scarborough busted out of that Arizona prison. Only thing is, despite his threats, he never did go after his ex-old lady and her new husband. Ed didn't exactly fade away into history, but he definitely spent the rest of his days lying low. And as far as I can tell, staying out of trouble. Word is that Scarborough crossed over into old Mexico and took to ranching. And for the next 30 years, save for a few clandestine trips to California to see his aging mother, Ed simply kept his head down and tended to his cows. Now, Scarborough's mama passed away in 1949, and it's at that point that we lose all contact with the cross-dressing, bike-shooting, skunk-fighting ex-ranger. 
Ed would have only been in his mid-60s around that time. And as far as I'm aware, nobody knows where or when he died. Legend has it that if you're riding your bicycle at night and you get to smelling a skunk, you'd be best advised to turn around and pedal like hell in the opposite direction. And that's about all I've got on Ed Scarborough. If you liked today's episode, don't thank me. Thank my friend David Lambert, as he's the one that made me aware of the insanity that was Ed Scarborough's life, and David's amazing thread on the man inspired this entire episode. If you're not familiar, David is an artist and a general all-around expert on Old West history and Western films. And I know he doesn't really like the term expert, but when it comes to this type of stuff, especially his encyclopedic knowledge of Westerns, there's just nobody better. And like I said, the dude is one hell of a talented artist. I currently have three pieces of his work hanging on the wall behind me right now as I speak. An uncanny depiction of Hank Williams Sr., Uh, Another is sort of a montage of a few different characters from the movie How the West Was Won. And my absolute favorite, a drawing of Warren Oates from Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. If you would like to own a print of that same drawing, David is currently selling them. Apparently, both his grandfathers killed each other in a duel or some such shit, and he stuck foot in the bill for the funeral. Link in the show notes if you want to check it out. And you can see more of David's work at patreon.com forward slash David Lambert art link also in the show notes. And you can find David on the wrong real podcast on occasion doing exactly what we're doing right now. Talking old West history. I actually had a chance to record a nice little conversation with him not too long ago where we touched on a number of topics that I think you'll find interesting. I have not had the time to edit it and get it ready for release yet, but hopefully soon. By the way, speaking of Warren Oates, Just in case you don't know who he is, great actor, in my opinion. You've definitely seen the guy in several movies. Films like The Wild Bunch, Major Dundee, Dillinger, In the Heat of the Night. The list goes on and on. But what you may not know, actually you probably do know this, I should say what I did not know until very recently, is that Warren Oates also played the drill sergeant in Stripes, a character who left us with one of my favorite quotes of all time. Lighten up, Francis. All right, shorter episode this week. Got a couple more David Lambert-inspired stories to share with y'all, and those will probably be a little on the shorter side as well. Doing episodes like this really helps me get ahead, and I do want to keep putting out quality episodes, which I consider this to be, on a consistent weekly basis. So if I can batch record a few of these shorter stories, I can spend even more time working on the long-form stuff as these are being released. Okay, if you're itching for additional true tales from the Wild and Wooly West, please head on over to wildwestextra.com. Check out the back catalog. While you're there, hit that contact button. Let me know what you think. Or even if you just have a topic suggestion for a future episode. Been getting a lot of great suggestions lately. Please check out my friend Michael over at Texas History Lessons. Till next time, try not to shoot anybody. Don't go getting in a fight with a skunk. And if you absolutely must dress up in your girlfriend's clothes and rob a restaurant, maybe just don't return to the same restaurant a few minutes later and try to order a damn appetizer, okay? Adios! But it gets worse. <laughs>